is Dr. Rudy Link of Patel of oh, Shizu. broadly cuts across multiple areas of modeling and analysis of climate and the water cycle. Dr. Ling is a chief scientist of the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy uh, Exoscale Climate uh, System Model, EM, E3SM. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, the American Geophysical Union, and the American Meteorological Society. She's published over 250 peer-reviewed articles. And so, come on up. in terms of a lot of the great contributions of Warren to climate modeling. And as we know, climate modeling has kind of evolved over time, and now we call, we call them both system modeling because we introduce biogeochemistry, and even now we not only introduce biogeochemistry, we're actually beginning to introduce what we call human systems into these kind of models. So this is why my, the topic of my talk is about from climate modeling to so-called human earth system modeling. And all along the way, we benefited so much from Warren's work as well as his and mine. And I'm going to show you examples of that. So first of all, um, I'm really lucky to be able to cross paths uh, with Warren. And OK, let me put back my glasses on, because I, <laughs> I don't think I can see that very well here. So um, Warren has, of course, done a lot of work. And so this is kind of like a little summary of what Bert has been talking uh, uh, to us about. And uh, this is really a journey about scientific discovery and use-inspired research through the development and the use of climate models. And so this has really also inspired. So Warren's work has inspired a lot of my own research. So that's why I kind of put them in parallel, and I will highlight for you some of the areas where we cross paths, and I have benefited so much from that. So, so Warren started out with simulation of sea ice in the, in the 1970s, as Bert mentioned. And then he um, also began to, do, to work on couple modeling. And then later on, he developed the parallel climate model, and, the, and then that merged into the CESM effort, and, and that continues on. And for myself, I started off my career um, beginning with working with regional climate modeling. So this is trying to get to high resolution because we weren't able to run global high resolution simulations at the time because we did, did not have the uh, computing resources to do that. So at that time, there were actually some criticism about uh, regional climate modeling. Some people said, oh, this is just garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> and partly, of course, the reason why they say garbage in is because maybe global climate models aren't really that good. Why are you feeding the information from global climate models to a regional climate model, and therefore you are just getting some garbage out of it? So, well, that's a pretty fair criticism. Uh, therefore, not a lot of agencies actually supported regional climate research at that time. Very interestingly, um, so beginning with the parallel climate model, I guess Warren was actually able to convince DOE that maybe PCM 
is not garbage <coughs> in. <laughs> and therefore, it makes sense to do some downscaling to see whether you can actually get useful, higher resolution information out of that. So it's really important that uh, beginning with this work using the PCM model, we were able to show that indeed this is not necessarily just garbage in, garbage out, and we were able to get some uh, useful information out of that. And I will, and I'm going to highlight a little bit of this part of work for you. And also, and, and then continue on. We begin to think about okay. So now that we have better, higher resolution regional information. Can we then potentially use that kind of information to really, for example, look at how climate change may be affecting the energy system, may be affecting water resources, etc.? So that's where we begin to introduce a lot more other types of models in this so-called end-to-end assessment framework. And at that time, uh, at PNL, where I work, so we developed an initiative called Prima Initiative. And Warren, um, we were really lucky to have Warren on our advisory panel. And we benefited so much from, from his advice. And I'm going to show you a lot of examples of how we benefited from Warren's advice. And then after that, then uh, fast forwarding to now. So as Bert mentioned, we begin to uh, develop another uh, Earth system model. This is called E3SM, Energy Exascale Earth System Model. And so with this effort, we also greatly benefited from the work of Warren through uh, the development of the CSM, which really forms the foundation of the E3SM model. So I highlighted these three areas for you. And it's interesting that our lives now seem to be like summarized by, by little locals. <laughs> so, so I have three little locals here, and I'm going to highlight these uh, examples for you. So beginning with this so-called Accelerated Climate Prediction Initiative, we call it ACPI, the ACT Initiative. So DOE funded a project between uh, 2000 and 2002. Again, as I said, believing that the PCM model is good enough to be used to perform downscaling so that we can get useful information. So this is essentially the idea of the ACPI project where we begin with global climate model, and I will mention to you a little bit about what's so um, innovative about that, right? And then, and then going down to regional scale and look at how climate change may be affecting water resources in the Western United States. So the project leads are listed over here. So Bert is one of the project leads, uh, and then Warren as well. And at that time, I was working um, through PNL uh, with Bill Pennell as the project lead. So as I said, uh, PCM is indeed uh, providing very useful information. So if you look at the figure here, so comparing the uh, precipitation and the temperature between the observation and the PCM simulation. And the PCM simulation was only done at so-called T42 resolution, which is about like 250 kilometers. It's really pretty coarse resolution. But quite amazing that even at that kind of resolution, at that time, this is like 2000, okay, so almost like 20 years ago, you can find that the model was able to reproduce pretty much the spatial pattern of precipitation and the temperature really quite well. And therefore, taking that kind of information, we were able to uh, downscale uh, the climate to higher resolution, and this is a paper, a joint paper that I published with Warren that I'm very proud of. So I want to highlight a little bit of innovations for you in terms of this particular project. It is quite interesting that even back in 2000, uh, we began to do ocean data simulation. So under the leadership of Warren and, and a few others on the project, especially like Tim Barnett and a few others. Uh, at that time, a lot of the climate simulations were done by, first of all, running beginning with the so-called pre-industrial period, because we do, we do not know how much the ocean has warmed up. But at that time, a new ocean data set called the Levitus data set was developed, and we were, we were able to assimilate the ocean data into the climate simulation, and therefore we do not have to start our simulation from 1890, which is the pre-industrial period, but rather assimilate the ocean condition into the simulation and start forward from 1995. So I think that was a pretty important innovation at that time, and really at the very early stage of ocean data simulation that Warren and others uh, were working on. And then I was able to take the information from PCM and then further downscale to about 40 kilometer resolution. 
And still, even nowadays, a lot of the regional planning simulation are, are still being done at this kind of resolution. And then we connect our information to hydrologic model and water management models to look at the impacts of climate change on water resources in the Columbia River Basin and also the Colorado River Basin. And then we also did three examples of simulations, which is also quite, quite important because at that time, most of the groups doing climate change simulations were only running a single simulation because of the limited resources. We were actually able to run simulation using three ensemble members. So now, uh, with the success of that project, then we realized that maybe we can really begin to expand in terms of the type of models that we include into the suite of so-called end-to-end assessment framework. And so this is what I was telling you about in terms of um, an initiative at PNNL. We call it the Prima Initiative. So here we begin to look at a broader set of end-to-end -end models. So you can see, I mean, this is not meant for you to look at all the details, but you can see, like, for example, we use a global climate model, CESM. We also include regional models, as well as integrated assessment model and very fine resolution impact assessment model like uh, agriculture model, um, water management model, energy sector model, etc. So compared to ACP, where we were only looking at global model to regional model, this is definitely a much larger, larger set of simulation, but potentially also a lot of pitfalls when you begin to really link a lot of these models together. And therefore, as our advisory, on our advisory panel, so Warren, always, almost at every advisory panel meeting, Warren always reminded us, he always said, be careful about conservation in your model. <laughs> and of course, you can understand because there's so many things that you're trying to link together. How do you make sure that, for example, the energy simulated by the regional model link to, let's say, crop model or water resources model? Is, is the linking really conserving water? And not only that, but we are now talking about models that have not only energy and water, but also biogeochemistry, like carbon. You also want to make sure that you conserve energy, water, and carbon as well. So that is indeed very challenging. And I didn't have a good answer for <laughs> Warren when he kept reminding us about conservation. And this, is, this turns out to be a very prophetic advice. Because later on, along the way, as we begin to look at other models, even including the D3SM model that I'm going to talk to you about, we ran into all kinds of conservation problems. <laughs> so I always remember Warren already told us that we need to be very careful about conservation, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. So um, with this um, uh, modeling framework, luckily, this is a regional modeling framework, uh, by and large. And therefore, potentially, even if you might have some non-conservation issue, it didn't show up all that clearly. But in any case, we were able to make use of this set of uh, models to gain some insight. And I just want to highlight one particular insight for you. So using those models that I talked to you about, we were able to, for example, look at water deficit projected into the future. So this is a map of the United States uh, simulated by our model looking at so-called water deficit, which is the difference between water supply and water demand. And of course, in the western United States, because it's a pretty dry area, you see a lot of water deficit. So we also wanted to project into the future how would water deficit change. And so we look at two different scenarios. One is the so-called uh, mitigation, climate mitigation scenario, which is called RCP 4.5. We also look at a kind of like business as usual scenario, which we call RCP 8.5. So first of all, you might imagine that with the climate mitigation scenario, we are able to cut down on the warming into the future. And therefore, with less warming, potentially there would be less evapotranspiration, and we hope that the climate mitigation scenario will tell us that the water deficit would not be as bad compared to a business as usual scenario. But what we found is actually not quite the case. We found exactly the opposite. The climate mitigation scenario actually gave us larger water deficit compared to the business as usual scenario. And that's because 
in order to achieve climate mitigation, you might have to use strategies such as growing bioenergy crop. But in order to grow bioenergy crop into the future without too much water, you have to rely a lot on irrigation. And therefore, it actually increases the water deficit compared to a business as usual scenario. So it shows us that this type of models can potentially be pretty useful for us to really look at uh, climate change impacts. So now fast forwarding to now, just a few years ago, so we begin to develop this um, Earth system model called E3SM. And the, probably the reason why we developed this model, again, is following the footstep of Warren, understanding the importance of using the models for not only scientific discovery, but also for use in spiral research, as well as following on to make use of big computers so that we can continue to push the limit of modeling. So there are two reports published back in uh, 2013, one particularly highlighting the fact that the energy sector may be very vulnerable to climate change in the future. Maybe there will be more extreme events like the storms, there might be sea level rise problem, there might also be uh, heat waves and this type of problem that would be affecting the energy sector. At the same time, the, the, another report also recognized that it is very important for us to recognize that we have been relying on supercomputers pretty much doubling in performance every 18 months in the, in the past so that we can use bigger and bigger computers and run higher and higher resolution simulations. But this report noted that this kind of doubling of computational performance every 18 months is ending. And therefore, we need to find an alternative path to exascale computing. And so marrying the two ideas together, then we uh, developed this E3SM model to be able to take advantage of exascale computer. We continue to push the limit of resolution we introduce human systems into our model so that we can link our research to use inspired type of uh, research, as well as also use big computers to produce multiple ensemble members to really characterize uncertainty. So, um, sorry. so then our model actually started out with uh, CESM1, which uh, is the model that NCAR um, and, and Warren <coughs> have been working on. So this is just a picture showing the CESM1 model as our V0 for our E3SM model. And then taking the atmospheric model and the land model pretty much the same, but replacing the ocean, sea ice, river, land ice, etc., we come out with our E3SM model version 1. One idea about this model is that now with new technology, uh, with the gridding system and things like that, we are able to run simulations at high resolution in a global context. For example, now every single component of our model, we can zoom in to a particular region where we do higher resolution, such as the atmospheric model, we can put higher resolution over North America. We can also put higher resolution uh, over Antarctica where we wanted to simulate the melting of the ice sheet and the impacts on the sea level rise. So, but we were met with a lot of challenges in the last few years. So first of all, we were coupling a lot of new models, like the MPAS ocean model, the MPAS sea ice model. They had never been coupled in an Earth system model before. And then, of course, another uh, big challenge that we face is pretty much a lot of the challenges we, we face is not about a specific in the individual component model, but about the whole coupled system. Again, this conservation problem arises, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. And also with a free surface ocean model that we are using, there is no place for you to hide. If you have any water conservation issue, you are going to see it in the sea level. <laughs> so this is what, exactly what we were seeing when we first started coupling the models together. We found that our sea level keep dropping in the couple simulation. In the first 100 years, the sea level in our model dropped by three meters. Three meters. <laughs> so that was very alarming. I said, oh, is there a hole in the ocean? <laughs> so again, that reminded me about the conservation uh, advice that uh, Warren mentioned. So, so, so then we dig into it and look at it very closely. We found several pretty easy to fix kind of problem. Okay, first of all, we found that oh, the, the grids were not matching very well. 
and there were some missing fluxes, runoff fluxes from the land. We, we, we missed that to the river and therefore did not pass those runoff to the ocean. So those were easy fixes. But then even when we look further, we found that the atmospheric model itself is not conserving water either. So by looking at that, we see that with the atmospheric model, in 100 years, we would lose 14.5 centimeter. Should I be happy about that? 14.5 centimeter is not as bad as three meters, right? Should I stop here? Maybe this is good enough. Well, I would say that this is not good enough because in the past 100 years, the global mean sea level has risen about just about 15 centimeters. So my model has to be doing better than that in terms of the, of the accuracy coming from water conservation. So that means we have to look into this. My atmospheric model cannot be losing water by 15 centimeters, which is as big as the observed sea level rise. <coughs> so then we open the hood, we look at all of these different components of the atmospheric model, and so these are just examples showing you the different parts of the model where we represent the dynamics and we represent the physics, and eventually we were able to fix a lot of the problems, and so we used a so-called new hybrid method to couple the dynamics and the physics together, and by doing that we were able to greatly reduce the water conservation problem, and so now, now our model the error related to the water conservation is reduced by a factor of 80. And so now we are pretty happy with a 0 0.002 centimeter of losing water per century, which is at least much, much smaller than the observed sea level rise in the past century. So with that, we were able to come up with two versions of our model, um, low resolution, high resolution. So this is just showing you an example of simulation at high resolution where we were able to simulate tropical cyclones. Not only tropical cyclones, but you can see when the tropical cyclones move by, you can see the sea, uh, the sea surface temperature affected by the strong winds and the updrawling, uh, bringing up the colder water. It's called the cold weights associated with tropical cyclones. So we are hoping that this model will allow us to look at extreme events, allow us to look at sea level rise, etc. So one last example I want to highlight for you is that now we are beginning to introduce human systems into our model and then there, there's another set of problems related to conservation because we have a lot more stuff into your model now. One example I'd like to sh talk to you about is this. A lot of time when we look at uh, climate simulations, we try to introduce, like represent irrigation because a lot of irrigation is going on around the world and oftentimes what we do is we calculate the soil moisture, and if there's not enough moisture for the crop to grow, then we just apply the water to irrigate, and the water just take out of the runoff, and sometimes it can cause actually negative runoff. So the better way to do this is to actually constrain how much water you can irrigate by looking at how much water is in the, is in the river and in the reservoir, right? So this is indeed what we have been doing, and we find that by doing that, it actually makes a significant <coughs> difference in terms of the seasonal distribution of the evapotranspiration coming from irrigation. But in order to attack this problem, actually we had to address a lot of difficulties in terms of mapping the grids between the river and the land, etc., etc. So just some closing remarks. So model development, I think, is a very long and treacherous path. <laughs> it's definitely science. Uh, needs a lot of experience. I think in some ways it's also an art, and also we also need some luck as well, I think. Uh, so climate and earth system modeling, I think they are now really major tools along with theories, observations, data mining, etc., for help to help us to advance climate science. But very importantly, I think we are standing on the shoulders of giants who really provided the theoretical, mathematical, and computational foundations to track new grounds and obviously Warren is one of the giants <laughs> that we have been relying on. And my last remark is, never take Warren's sage advice very lightly. He told us about, be careful about conservation. And we have been dragging out. <laughs> along the way, we have been dealing with this conservation problem with water, energy, and carbon all the time. So thank you very much, Warren. For